welcome to the CHCI CSDS event. Um, the Consortium of Humanities Institutes and Centers is a global network of humanities scholars. Uh, CSDS is happy to be part of the CHCI network. And with CHCI, we bring to you a keynote address by Professor Warwick Anderson that was recorded on occasion of the annual meeting of CHCI 2021. Now, Prof Professor Warwick Anderson uh, is the Janet Dora Hine Professor of Politics, Governance and Ethics in the Department of History and the leader of the Politics, Governance and Ethics team with the Charles Perkins Center, University of Sydney. He is a well-known historian of science, medicine and public health, focusing on Australasia, the Pacific and Southeast Asia, as well as the United States, and works on ideas of biomedicine, virology, immunology, race, human difference and citizenship in the 19th and 20th centuries. There could be nobody more apt to speak to our contemporary viral condition. So we bring to you the talk keynote address by Professor Warwick Anderson. Since we have been um, working across multiple time zones from Australia to the US. Unfortunately, we have not been able to bring you a live event, but we have uh, recorded parts of the conversation in various locations and stitched them together uh, for your listening. Uh, after the keynote, address, which we shall bring to you shortly, Professor Anderson and some faculty of CSDS also had a longish conversation around Professor Anderson's work in general, but also some questions specific to the keynote address that he uh, uh, gave recently. Now, many of uh, his names of his books and essays will come up in the conversation. So I'm not kind of taking too much time in giving you a list of his innumerable publications, but the ones that we have read and enjoyed and learned from and the ones which have been most famous across the world is of course one, Colonial Pathologies, American Tropical Medicine, Race and Hygiene in the Philippines, a much awarded book uh, came out in um, uh, 2006 and 2008 in Manila but also his fantastic 2014 short book uh, from John Hopkins, Intolerant Bodies, A Short History of Autoimmunity, and also a number of essays, and you might be interested in looking up a recent issue of History and Theory, where Professor Anderson collates a number of essays and writes himself on the question of if there can be a post-colonial critique of biomedicine or a decolonial history of science. So in all senses of the term, Professor Anderson is the person to speak to in today's time. We welcome you to enjoy his keynote address first and then uh, also enjoy the long conversation that we at CSDS had with. Hello, I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Bungal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay respects to elders past and present. I, I want to say a few words today about how we might have critical humanities under duress. Specifically, I want to reflect on how we can do history in a pandemic. What it would mean, therefore, to think through the history of the present. Admittedly, history of the present is an overused phrase, uh, almost banal, uh, 
but I'm referring here to Michel Foucault's original formulation. Foucault was urging historians to uncover hidden genealogies and alternative pasts, traces of history that might disturb or cause us to reconstitute our understanding of the present. What was once thought uh, simple or, and unified thus becomes far more diverse and unsettled, perhaps even a little decolonized. That's what I want to begin to do today. I'm looking at something about the pandemic that we've come to take for granted and showing how historically strange and limited it really is, how it might be otherwise. I'm referring to contemporary disease modeling, ideas about R naught or R zero. Uh, that's the basic reproduction rate of the, of the virus indicating its transmissibility. Ideas about flattening the curve or getting R zero below one and the achievement of herd immunity. Modeling tells us when to lock down and whether to don masks, to distance socially or to sanitize. We've learned to understand the COVID-19 pandemic through models and simulations. Uh, but this way of framing a disease outbreak is historically peculiar. I might even say unprecedented, though not quite. While it's a relatively new conceptual tool or mode of coming to judgment in a crisis, disease modelling does have a history, a revealing and somewhat disconcerting history. In telling stories about disease modelling or tales of epidemiological reasoning, I want to touch also on the issue of crisis technologies, how they inject certain kinds of subject positions and relations into calculations of disease control while immunizing against others. I'm particularly interested in what or who falls beyond the scope of statistical reasoning. What or who, or who gets left out? The excess and waste that's implied in disease models, the persons and relations that do not acquire value and become parametized. That is the voiding of the subjects and sociality that we in the humanities care about. I'm interested in how what we value comes to be left aside as, stat as statistical waste or rejected as mere noise. As you've probably guessed, this is inherently a colonial story, a complicated story about assumptions of sovereignty. There's no doubt the pandemic has flushed out a gaggle of historians of medicine, all of us eager to help understand the current predicament. Many historians have tried to dig deep into their knowledge of different diseases in different times in order to make sense of COVID-19. Accordingly, we're told COVID-19 is a lot like cholera or smallpox or AIDS or Ebola or more promisingly influenza and SARS. Such a rush to appear useful is commendable, but many of these historical analogies fail to advance our knowledge of the way we live now. Some have obscured more than they revealed. A few historians, including me, warn that each epidemic makes its own history, that each is specific, contingent on the circumstances of the time. Thus, there are no simple lessons to be learnt from histories of past pandemics. But then again, other historians remind us it's possible to discern recurrent patterns in the ways in which societies have comprehended and responded to epidemic diseases. Variations at least on a common theme, if you like a fluid dramaturgy or flexible repertoire. That is, we can learn something about our perceptions of COVID-19 and our responses to the disease from history, so long as we are willing to engage closely with our contemporary situation. To take advantage of history, then, we need first to think sociologically and ecologically about our current predicament, to examine history in the making, not only history already done, which brings me back, of course, 
to the history of the present. First, let me say a few words about framing our current predicament, the COVID-19 pandemic, as a crisis. As I expect you know, to the ancient Greeks, the word crisis meant discrimination or decision. In the Hippocratic corpus, uh, a crisis was the moment in a disease or fever when its course is determined, a turning point tending either to recovery or death, and implied that a verdict or judgment had been reached. Reinhard Koselleck suggested that the metaphoric flexibility of crisis, this, this concept with its inherent demand for decisions and choices, as he put it, allowed it to become a central catchword in Europe from the 17th century onwards. Its everyday clinical significance gradually declined, though lingering in the vague parlance of critical condition and critical care. Meanwhile, as Koselleck relates, uh, the concept of crisis has come increasingly to frame the body politic, denoting a moment of judgment and diagnosis, as well as the prescription for a therapy. Both diagnostic and prognostic, the term conveys the sense of an illness, but also portends an impending transition or else the blocking of radical change. Unlike other organic analogies, such as reproductive cycles or life cycles, a crisis is anticipatory, progressive and dynamic. Thus the concept of crisis, Koselleck writes, has become the fundamental mode of interpreting historical time. It is a structural signature of modernity. Personal or embodied crises may call for prognostication and augury, or psychological inquiry, or the application of techniques of physical examination and technologies like the thermometer and fever chart. As metaphor and model in the body politic itself uh, scaled up similarly, of course, crisis gave rise to historical, sociological and economic explanations, all emerging in the 19th century in order to configure one challenge or another. When epidemic diseases such as cholera swept across Europe and North America in this period, such health crises magnified across a population, prompted the development of statistical maps and data correlations in efforts to render epidemics coherent and actionable. Outbreak modeling and epidemic intelligence or epidemiology have become ever more elaborate and compelling during the past 40 years, reaching their apogee in explaining and attempting to manage the COVID-19 crisis. The use of the concept of crisis, Koselleck tells us, is meant to reduce the room for manoeuvre, forcing actors to choose between diametrically opposed alternatives. Increasingly, this has expedited a reductionist analysis of the situation along with quantification, standardization of data and statistical modeling of the emerging problem. Defining an event, an event as a crisis appears to favor specific analytic technologies poised for quick judgment. Expertise in crisis management has burgeoned since the 1980s in response to large scale industrial and environmental disasters and now pandemic disease. Such apprehending and figuring out of a rapidly evolving new threat in a short decision time needs to be distinguished from long-term risk assessment and preparedness for potential hazards. A crisis should be differentiated also from a state of emergency, which often follows a special temporality, implying a limited interlude or exception. Thus emergencies usually are seen as unpredictable and brief exceptions to the normal order, a temporary suspension with uh, the expectation of return to normality. Whereas a crisis may be prolonged and generally implies a decisive shift to a new normal. Similarly, crisis can be distinguished from catastrophe, which as Isabel Stenger's notes uh, means a crisis from which there is no recovery and therefore no demand for a decision. Accordingly, defining a problem as a crisis 
will mobilize distinctive analytic technologies with distinct temporal and spatial parameters. My question here is, can we imagine how COVID-19 might be figured or assembled otherwise, reconstituted as a more heterogeneous object of knowledge, as a different and more encompassing moment of truth, uh, not simply as a measured telos delivering us a new normal. This rather involved question may become clearer if I tell you more about the history of, of epidemic modelling. After demonstrating in 1897 that mosquitoes transmit malaria parasites, tropical medicine pioneer Ronald Ross conducted a series of statistical studies of malaria control in the British Empire. He thus introduced qual quantitative modelling into epidemiology, which he called uh, pathometry, an ecological, one might say multi-species mindset informed his investigation of transmission dynamics and control, though the models lacked sociological complexity, depending instead on facile racial typologies to explain human behaviour. Like so many others in colonial medicine, Ross became obsessed with insect-human interactions, with measuring malaria transmission entomologically by mosquito density, at the expense of any nuanced understanding of the sociality and cultures of local human populations. In the early 20th century, Alfred Lotka, a statistician for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, elaborated on Ross's disease models, introducing from demography, from human population science, the notion of a net reproduction rate per generation, or net fertility, a fundamentally Malthusian parameter. In the 1950s, George MacDonald, the director of the Ross Institute of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, also would turn his attention to the mathematical theory of malaria transmission on the eve of the International Eradication Program. MacDonald borrowed Lotka's demographic concept of the basic reproduction ratio for the disease, calling it uh, Z0 or Z0, I suppose, or Z0, meaning the number of hosts in a susceptible population expected to be infected by a single already infected host. MacDonald focused on the benefits of DDT in reducing mosquito transmission in lowering what later became known as R0. Disease modelling is thus a story of how mosquitoes briefly became humans and humans lastingly became mosquitoes. Rather than entering a more than human world, we were modelled into or snared in a less than human colonial net. It was not until the late 1970s that Robert May and Roy Anderson at Oxford and then at Imperial College London began to popularise the concept of intrinsic or basic of the intrinsic or basic reproduction number and the accompanying accompanying symbol R zero, applying it to other infectious diseases. The first question that ecologists ask of a virus May could write in 1993 is what is its basic reproductive rate? What is its fitness? The priority of this question was largely the result of his statistical analysis during the previous decade. Trained as a theoretical physicist, uh, May had reoriented his research towards modelling while working with population biologist Robert MacArthur at Princeton. In the late 1970s, he joined Anderson, a British parasitologist, in overhauling the quantitative study of interactions of disease agents and their hosts. Around 1982, they both realised that R0 is central to an understanding both of the epidemiology of infectious diseases 
and the impact of control policies. The primary determinants of a respiratory virus's intrinsic reproductive rate appeared to be the agent's transmissibility, the density of the susceptible population, and the frequency of contacts within it. Epidemiologists effectively were reimagining human communities as elementary biological collectives or herds. In other words, the models were predicated on simplified assumptions of contamination and defilement within a homogeneous population, not on particular social, cultural or ecological configurations. This has turned into a story then of how quantitative modelling of disease outbreaks might embed connections with other animal collectives more than human relations, while usually discounting or ignoring human sociality and cultural difference, thereby ref refiguring demos simply as zoe. In a sense then, when Bruno Latour demands more ecological insight, and Eben Kirksey recommends multi-species perspectives in our apprehensions of the COVID-19 pandemic, they may be missing the point. Disease modelling already gathers and connects species, but generally as asocial and unstructured, even anomic collectivities. One might even say as bare life. According to epidemiologist Gideon Meyerowitz Katz, even the best, most sophisticated models only take the first steps in the tangled web of interconnectivity we call society. So uh, let me rephrase my earlier question. How might modelers recognize the heterogeneity of collectives and the diversity of relations within and between them, thereby deriving more intricate inclusive and realistic ecological reasoning. In the late 20th century, Anderson and May, along with another former physicist, Neil Ferguson, who's now responsible for the Imperial College models of COVID-19 in Britain, set about modeling bovine spongiform encephalopathy, BSE, or mad cow disease, and a subsequent outbreak of foot and mouth disease among what they called the national herd. Their predictive epidemiological modeling was still predicated on assumptions of a homogeneous animal population distributed across uniform space, a schema lacking any stochastic or random elements and omitting any specific transmission rate parameters. In the foot and mouth disease outbreak, achievement of an R0 of less than one, thereby deflecting the crisis, seemed to demand an immediate cull of all susceptible animals near any infected farm, which resulted in the slaughter of almost six million sheep and cattle. And sociologist John Law reflected, a simple but opaque epidemiological technology was used to draw an unnecessarily alarmist line through the animal collective. Ferguson and colleagues later applied these density dependent models, slightly modified, to simulate epidemics of influenza and SARS among humans, mostly in Southeast Asia, and now COVID-19 in Britain and elsewhere. I've already published extensively on contemporary practices of epidemic modeling in Britain and Australia, so I won't go into the details here. What I've tried to do though, is trace rather briefly, the colonial genealogy of these epidemiological techniques and modes of calculation. Modeling has proven a compelling apparatus of anticipatory governance during the COVID-19 crisis, allowing a sense of expeditious judgment with creditable leisure demand of scientific technique. According to sociologist Tim Rhodes and his colleagues, COVID-19 is coming to be known in maths and models. Mathematical models and projections have become ubiquitous.
emerging at a moment of actuarial saturation, statistical models or simulations help to simplify decision making in exigent and complex conditions, substituting in effect the speculative forecast for the messy sciences of the actual. Modelling makes certain population policies and subject positions conceivable, even necessary. Silencing other voices and alternative imaginations of the future, further reducing room to manoeuvre in a crisis, enacting a performance of calculation and control at the same time as it conveys a sense of depoliticizing debate. Once an obscure epidemiological enthusiasm, models these days are lived as anticipated potentials affecting actions, publics and policies in the now, as Rhodes puts it. And thus being treated as a herd, people find that the scope of social life, its range of potentialities gets constricted and homogenized. And they feel ever more alienated and excluded from decision making. To be sure, we, we may need to model our way out of a crisis to make abstraction work for us, to get busy with the pandemic, but must our models be so circumscribed and limited, their performance so inhibiting? Can we turn to the humanities and qualitative social sciences to aid in reconstituting the crisis as a more encompassing and ambient subject of knowledge, permitting greater cultural, sociological and biological complexity, and thereby affording more room to maneuver. Can critical humanities help us rethink our models to socialize or de-herd or decolonize them? To apprehend a pandemic surely requires critical inquiry in the sense that critique and critical derive from the same root as crisis. Passing judgment on the merits of something is what we must do in a crisis. Foucault associated critique with the art of voluntary insubordination that have reflected intractability and therefore represented it as a form of epistemic virtue. But it seems timely here to return critique to its pre-enlightenment origins, to recuperate it as the art of making decisions or distinctions of deliberation, not simply as the art of not being governed. As Wendy Brown argues, we need to reunite critique and crisis, recognizing a critical condition as an urgent call for knowledge, deliberation, judgment, and action to stave off catastrophe. She recommends the depiction of critique as non-optional in the restoration of an organism's or polity's health. Similarly, Latour attempts to rework critique through the merging of matters of fact into highly complex, historically situated, richly diverse matters of concern. For him, the critic is not one who debunks, but one who assembles. I'm old enough to recall the same protestations and remonstrances in the 1980s during the AIDS pandemic. Uh, another crisis, to be sure, uh, but one rarely compared to our current predicament uh, for reasons unclear to me. The difference then was that we were asking how to have theory in an epidemic. According to Paula Treichler, the critical response to AIDS was the struggle for an intelligent vision to live by in the face of crisis, contradiction, and the urgent need to make life or death decisions. One could translate that struggle into another question in another era, how do we have critical theory in the COVID-19 pandemic? Treichler was making a, a plea for the careful examination of language and culture 
that enables us as members of intersecting social constellations to think carefully about ideas in the midst of a crisis. She was seeking a broader epidemiology of signification, an eclectic, accessible and responsive epidemiological remodeling, which might in incorporate complexity, difference, otherness. It was critical to understand how various kinds of knowledge are produced, the rules and universes of discourse through which truth is variously represented and understood. Late last century, in Impure Science, Steve Epstein showed how activists were able to reimagine AIDS in the 1980s, often persuading scientists and epidemiologists to share or at least acknowledge uh, other sociological and sometimes ecological visions. These activists were yoking together moral or political arguments and methodological or epistemological arguments and conducting a sustained lay invasion of the domain of scientific fact-making. This was not a matter of debunking or unmasking the sciences, rather it was a form of critical care a means of tending to their impoverished and wasted condition, feeding them up. It was critique, as Latour and Donna Haraway advised, a gathering or assembling of ever more subjects and participants, the crafting of matters of concern. Just to be clear, I'm alluding to a history of the present crisis not in order to reject modelling, but rather to imagine it otherwise. I'd like to use the humanities not to debunk modelling, but to show that epidemiological reasoning need not be limited to a particular colonial technology. Those of us in the critical humanities should be thinking about how pandemics might be assembled and inhabited differently. Thank you. We at CSDS are very happy to have this opportunity to converse with you uh, about the lecture and about your other writings also. Uh, my colleagues, Pratma Banerjee, uh, Vaitik Bhattacharya, uh, and my colleague Sundaram, four of us for joining this conversation. Uh, very briefly, Pratma and I are historians uh, Vedic comes from literature, and uh, Ravi Sundar has done a lot of work on, on, on data and digital cultures. He's got a beautiful book, Pirate Modernity. Um, so, uh, if you could just start, uh, uh, I have two responses uh, to your lecture. Uh, uh, let me go one by one. Uh, the first is uh, for some time now, there's been this talk that we need to produce more accounts that are more than human accounts. So whether it's climate change or virus, this talk comes up again and again. And I thought one of the things that you were proposing was that such accounts do exist and have existed for a long time. Uh, they sometimes are not as prominent as at other times, but they've been around. So it's not simply a matter of having more than human accounts, but also the kind of accounts that matter. So the kind of ecological reasoning uh, becomes important. And in your own work, uh, you have written about several of these, including disease ecology. So could you say a bit more on what kind of ecological reasoning you think is, is more apt for our times today in the pandemic? Certainly, yes. And first, let me uh, uh, say how Sorry I am that I can't be there with you uh, today. Uh, I have fond memories, as you may know, of uh, time spent at the CSDS some 25 years ago, I think. So it's been too long and I'd love to get back there. But obviously uh, this year and next year are going to be terribly difficult. And I hope, uh, we all hope, I'm sure, that uh, matters improve to the extent that we can meet up again. Uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, yes, as you say, um, I've been interested in histories of disease ecology, uh, that is ecological reasoning within biomedicine or uh, infectious diseases research in particular, uh, 
uh, for some 20 years or more, actually, I've been writing about uh, the, the modes of ecological reasoning within biomedicine uh, for some time. Uh, I'm always surprised when people, friends of mine like Evan Kirksey and others, uh, and Bruno Latour for that matter, uh, saying, well, we need to think more ecologically uh, when there's been this very active uh, tradition within infectious diseases research, at least, of thinking ecologically, which they don't seem to draw on. So anyhow, uh, that, that has surprised me. But uh, so I've been writing about uh, uh, disease ecology for uh, many years now. And uh, it's a, it's a, the, the ecological uh, turn, if you like, in um, biomedicine was really prompted by pandemics in the first place. And I'm thinking in particular of the 1918-19 uh, influenza pandemic, uh, which emerged and caused devastation completely unexpectedly. People just did not know how to explain this. And so there was a search for what was called more complexity and realism uh, within uh, epidemiology, the study of patterns of disease. And uh, this meant that some people, such as McFarlane Burnett, about whom I've written extensively, uh, turned to uh, evolutionary biology uh, and ecology in order to try to under understand disease emergence and spread, if you like. Um, how do diseases take off? What are the circumstances? How do they find new ecological niches to colonize, if you like? Um, so that was a huge stimulus to this field uh, before World War II. Um, and so uh, Burnett was very interested in, he coined the term actually, disease ecology about 1936. And he was very interested in looking at competition between parasites and hosts, or between microbes and humans, if you like, and, and what promoted uh, the proliferation, if you uh, want to use that term, of microbes or the uh, uh, resistance of humans, the hosts, to them. So um, he, he was drawing on the work of ecologists like, uh, uh, like um, Elton and uh, Julian Huxley and uh, and um, also uh, uh, A.J. Nicholson, the Australian ecologist. So that was, uh, so what I'm saying is that, that that was one of the modes of ecological reasoning that we should be thinking of as a resource to understand COVID-19. But there are others that have developed over the last 70 or more years. After World War II, uh, some figures in uh, infectious diseases research, such as René Dubois, and uh, Frank Fenner uh, started to emphasize the physical environment. So not just this notion of competition between microorganisms and macroorganisms, but the physical environment as well. And th th they were drawing on the work of, uh, of uh, Andrew Wather and Birch and other ecologists who wanted to get away from the earlier density dependent theories of the uh, uh, distribution and abundance of animals, if you like. So, um, and then uh, as I've written about recently, I think the third mode uh, of, uh, of uh, disease e ecology um, is really uh, as it applies to global uh, scales of um, emergence. And that is to uh, uh, climate change, and the degradation of the Earth's life support systems. Mm -hmm. And there's a new field that's emerged called planetary health about which I'm writing at the moment. And they, the people in that, um, like Tony McMichael, uh, Steve Boyden, uh, Andy Haynes, people like that, epidemiologists, uh, infectious diseases experts and others um, have actually dr uh, drawn on systems ecology work of Evelyn Hutchinson and uh, the Odoms and so on, and brought that into biomedicine as a resource. So um, there are multiple modes of ecological reasoning. Uh, now, uh, 
the, the, this notion of ecological, the ecology of diseases really uh, gained impetus in the 1980s with um, AIDS, another pandemic, and people wanting to understand the uh, reasons for the emergence of AIDS. And since then, multiple, uh, what appear to be new diseases or old diseases finding new ecological niches um, and leading up to COVID-19. So I think it's important to understand that this is a tradition which has a history which we need to know about and it has uh, contemporary implications. Having said all of that, I mean, having said all of that, the main argument though of my talk today has really been the importance of not only thinking ecologically using these biological, uh, broader biological framings of disease emergence and transmission, but also perhaps drawing on another long integrative tradition within biomedicine called social medicine. And social medicine emphasizes uh, the socioeconomic determinants of disease and how society and culture shapes disease patterns. So, and this has been around even longer than disease ecology, really, you can trace it right back in a formal way to the work of uh, Rudolf Virchow in the uh, uh, middle of the 19th century. Um, uh, but it, it, it has continued. And I think the real problem that we see here is not so much the, uh, the lack of attention to ec ecology, but it's an ecology that has a very impoverished sociology or uh, structural, a very impoverished structural uh, component, um, uh, social structural component. And so I think that that's what I was trying to say that we actually need to think more sociologically, at least uh, look at the, these biological collectives as much more heterogeneous, not only biologically, but sociologically, if you like. So it, it really applies the notion to, of the social beyond the human as well. Uh, to that's social a point life that you made. Other animals. Mm. So, so that's a point that you made very clearly, uh, very, very powerfully uh, in the lecture uh, of, of the impoverished uh, sociology of the modeling exercise. And that's why you feel that critical humanities uh, can play a big role uh, in terms of yeah, ab absolutely. I think this is actually something that we uh, need to uh, contemplate what role critical humanities and the qualitative social sciences more generally might uh, uh, play, uh, what our contributions can be to framing the epidemic or the pandemic, to understanding it and intervening in it as well. Um, and so uh, uh, the, I think it's important to understand the genealogy of contemporary epidemiological reasoning uh, in order to uh, place or replace ecology in that, but also sociology as well. And it's, it's been a complaint of many people, even within the field of disease ecology, that once they turn to the social, uh, once they try to um, factor in, if you like, the social, they just don't see any resources to do that. Mm -hmm. they, they actually, are, if at best, they turn to evolutionary psychology and sociobiology. This is what Burnett did, actually. He, he was a great uh, believer in uh, rather simplistic sociobiology because he always, he had fantastic biological intuition, but as a rather reserved and uh, uh, awkward person he had no, no appreciation of the social at all and I think this is something that um, that we should be able uh, to do mm -hmm. uh, but having said that I, I think it's also important to understand that when I'm talking about trying to uh, build or construct uh, a much richer and realistic sociological configuration or cultural configuration in our understanding of disease uh, emergence and transmission and treatment for that matter. 
because vaccines too have a, an ecology, of course. Um, I mean, I think that uh, once we try to do that, we have to to be careful also that we don't end up uh, allowing those sort of sociological configurations to be vehicles for stigma and prejudice as well. And this is something that we did see with AIDS, that when yes. people did try to resort to uh, cultural or sociological explanations, uh, they were in effect expressions of, uh, of uh, discrimination and prejudice. And so, uh, but again, I mean, we, we deal with this all the time, how to, uh, how to uh, deconstruct uh, and take apart simplistic typologies and blaming. So yeah. I think we, again, this is a role for us to play and if you like, we could, uh, we should be able to police uh, the humanistic studies and uh, sociological inquiries. Pratma, did you want to follow up with something? Yeah, muted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How many times have I heard that over, <laughs> the last, over the last year? Yes. Uh, yes, I I had a question uh, about uh, a, a kind of poignant phrase that you used regarding this pandemic. You called it uh, a moment of truth, uh, as opposed to say the other ways of talking about our present, which is either crisis. Uh, which, drawing on Kosovic's work, uh, you rightly say, is a mode of thinking the moment where the room for maneuverability is so reduced that we are forced to make uh, black and white choices. Or the more popular word in today's times, catastrophic, um, uh, a state of being from which uh, there is no going back, no, no emerging uh, on the other side, as it were. So I wanted you to talk a little more on this particular framing of the present as a moment of truth. Uh, truth being uh, an, a, a kind of term which has both uh, ethical as well as epistemological implications. So, that, so how does one really think uh, of this time as a learning moment in a deep sense of the matter? Uh, yes, uh, it's a it's a difficult question uh, to answer, really, but it's one that we must address. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the term ethics, ethical, uh, because I think in some ways uh, the whole of the talk was really about uh, ethics, uh, the ethics of engagement with uh, our current predicament. Um, Yes, I was surprised actually when I came to think about COVID-19 and to, uh, to write the talk as well, uh, that um, uh, so few people had actually, so many, so few of our colleagues in the humanities had, um, uh, had examined the use of the term crisis uh, or indeed emergency or catastrophe or whatever. Uh, it seemed odd in that there's such a rich, critical, if I may use that term, critical literature on this, as you mentioned, Koselleck, um, but also the work of Wendy Brown and uh, Janet Reutemann and many others. Uh, and uh, it was odd that, um, that we weren't attending more closely to the tempo, if you like, or the time frame frames really the time frames of the pandemic and uh, and so that's what I wanted to uh, begin to do uh, in this talk uh, it's by no means complete of course um, and there are many unanswered questions um, the uh, uh, I think the notion of a crisis technology and you could say that the, the model or simulation as a crisis technology. And indeed the vaccine as it's currently constituted and uh, represented is also a crisis technology, which I think is one of the problems for its um, lack of success in some contexts. Um, 
because there isn't that interest in configuration, which might help make it uh, an object that's more uh, uh, more assimilable in a sense. Um, so uh, the um, yes, so I, I think there. Uh, uh, we do need to think about this notion of a crisis technology, about uh, how one turns to these things or constitutes them, creates them even, uh, out of, uh, uh, in a situation where uh, there's a perceived need for more data, an urgency in the uh, uh, decision making, um, and so on. It, it, it's something that we, uh, try to, uh, it, it does, as, as Koselik and you have just said, it means it reduces the room for maneuver, but it also reduces the opportunity for contributions from outside a limited and rather opaque uh, group of experts, of so-called experts. So, so I think we need to think about how this might be constituted otherwise as a different moment of truth, if you like. Uh, now that's something, it, it's uh, in a sense a, um, a provocation for others to take up, I hope. Um, uh, certainly I don't think I should be in the position of uh, assuming some sort of authority over how we do this, but I would like to provoke others to think about this. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, just one idea is that uh, when modelers justify modeling, they say we have so little data, so we have to model. Uh, but it's what counts as data, which I think is crucial here. And if we can actually reframe the situation and saying, there is an enormous amount of data out there, huge amount of data, but you're just not seeing it there. It's not visible to you as modelers. And I think that's, uh, that should actually, uh, I think in a sense, um, challenge the notion that this has to be a crisis technology and oversimplified, simplistic, if you like. Um, and again, I mean, this is clearly uh, a, um, uh, an opportunity for scholarship in the humanities and the qualitative social sciences more generally. Uh, I'd like to say too, if I don't know whether this is the ideal time to say it, but uh, the other part of the, uh, uh, the other theme, I suppose, that runs through the talk and may not have been entirely evident, um, uh, or exp rendered explicit, I suppose, um, is that this is actually a decolonizing project. It's an effort to decolonize knowledge at some level uh, in the sense that it's to challenge in a data sovereignty, if you like, claims of absolute authority over data and the model and how we uh, frame the pandemic, how we give the pandemic a tempo. If, and so I think this is something that uh, uh, could be read as post-colonial critique as well. And, and in, 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 a, in a much more obvious way, so much of this modeling has come from colonial medicine, which is extraordinary really, and been tried out on, uh, uh, on populations, the models have been tried out on populations in uh, the global south. Uh, and so uh, in a sense, um, uh, one is, it is very ex uh, explicitly a, a colonial modeling process. But I think in a more general epistemological sense, we need to think about decolonizing uh, data sovereignty. Sure. Do you want to come back? <laughs> That's totally crucial, though uh, much of the debate uh, in the world is also around, uh, 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 you know, uh, fudging of data and suppression of data by governments, 
uh, which is another register of this debate on data sovereignty. Uh, who do we share the da our data with uh, and such like. But what you say in terms of uh, the fact that there is actually data available uh, out there, we only, only need to recognize it, is a very important point, an interesting point to make. Uh, um, uh, perhaps if you could say a sentence or two more uh, with an example on, for instance, if it is not to be government data per se. Uh, yes, well, I, I, I do have a... Yeah. Yep. Now, I do have a, a, an example, which, uh, uh, although I'm based in Sydney, I'm formerly a Melbourneian, uh, but there was an outbreak in Melbourne. There, it was, um, uh, and there was a very severe lockdown for um, a few months, which has ended up with there being no community transmission for many months since. Um, now, uh, I was watching the television from Melbourne uh, and the outbreak was in, detected initially in Housing Commission high-rise flats, uh, these blocks of flats, uh, uh, and um, uh, mostly occupied for the last few decades, I suppose, by uh, refugees and immigrants from the Horn of Africa, from Somalia and Eritrea and Ethiopia and so on, Sudan. Um, and I remember the epidemiologist, one of the epidemiologists, because they had a model for all of this, but the, he said he, on the television, he said, the problem is no one knows what happens in those flats. Nobody, we don't, no one knows what happens in those flats. We don't know about routes of transmission, relations, interactions, sociality. No one knows. Now, of course, there were probably uh, social workers, sociologists, anthropologists even, who did know, but it's certainly the people inside there knew mm -hmm. what happened. But, th 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 but that wasn't recognised as data. Yeah. That wasn't yeah. data. Yeah. Uh, it didn't exist. No one knew. And so that's just one example, uh, maybe a little too localised uh, for this yeah. audience, but, but I think uh, one could multiply that almost infinitely oh, during the pandemic, yeah. Absolutely. yeah. I just wanted to stay with the decolonization uh, question because it's really a kind of very, very live question for us too in this side of the world. Uh, so in context of that, uh, I wanted to ask uh, you to speak on how biomedical concepts can be decolonized and or because there is, of course, a huge literature on how philosophical concepts, whether it be liberty or equality or, you know, or the self can be decolonized. But technology as such seems to be uh, more opaque to decolonization moves. So I wanted to ask you in terms of how does one uh, decolonize biomedical concepts? And I ask this in context of the fact that the concept of immunity has been uh, making the rounds for actually now quite some time, quite a few decades, uh, as a term directly borrowed from biomedicine uh, and applied by philosophy uh, in diagnosing questions of body politic. Um, so, you have written on it, and we have read that essay with, uh, and debated that essay for a while, actually, amongst ourselves. But really wanted you to reflect more in the decolonization frame, which was not so much part of that essay that, I, as, as far as I remember. Yes, that's true. It's it's, it's a very challenging uh, set of questions you've uh, uh, posited. Uh, so, um, uh, where to start? I mean, I think the first thing is to uh, is to question the meaning of decolonization in some ways. I mean, I've written a lot about this along with uh, many other colleagues uh, uh, and with Gabriela Soto Laviaga, we edited a special issue of history and theory uh, just last year on decolonizing histories of science and the relations of of a settler colonial uh, impetus uh, 
for decolonization to the older post-colonial critique. Um, and so I think, uh, um, I, I think what you mean is that uh, there's a sense that, and I, and I wrote about this last century, as did David Arnold, as you'd know, that uh, all uh, medicine is uh, colonial in its relations to the body of the patient, if you like. Uh, there is a, an imp implicit colonialism there. Now, whether one could ever decolonize that in an absolute term, uh, and uh, uh, I, I wonder, but uh, it, it wouldn't look like medicine then. It wouldn't be biomedicine, maybe that doesn't matter. But, um, but I think one can at least provide some sort of post-colonial critique, uh, looking at it uh, in a sense, in a non-colonial way, or revealing the colonial structure of equalities anyhow. Uh, that are implicit there and maybe doing something about that. Um, I think it's a, a very difficult question uh, if you want a, a specific program of implementation. I don't, don't know how one would start that. I think in some ways, uh, many of us have been doing this historically anyhow, but also many people have been doing it anthropologically uh, ethnographically and sociologically uh, and politically as well in terms of activism and so on. Um, and so uh, and I think these, in a sense, these uh, uh, alternative or at least complementary, I suppose to use that term, complementary uh, voices and visions need to be recognized. And that would be one way of doing it, whether one ever actually uh, removes the colonialism from biomedicine or any other type of healing, really. I don't know that that would be feasible, but I think in some ways it's again a matter of the itinerary rather than the destination that matters here. Yeah. Now, the issue of autoimmunity is an intriguing one. I must say, until you ask that question, then I hadn't really thought of how uh, auto the notion of autoimmunity. I'm assuming you're thinking of the work of Derrida and so on, um, how that might actually be uh, related to say disease ecology. I think it is, it is something that I'd like to reflect on some more at some point. I mean, of course Derrida, uh, as most people uh, listening to this may know, um, from I think Spectres of Marx onwards, uh, started to uh, use the notion of autoimmunity. And he said at one point that for him, autoimmunization, I think he called it, now substitutes for deconstruction. Uh, and I took that to mean really that uh, he wanted to connect deconstruction up with biopolitics to make it more biopolitical and have biopolitical implications obviously as well. Um, and so, and he, I think you could argue that autoimmunity is in itself a decolonizing process. It's decolonizing the sovereignty of the, it's challenging anyhow, the sovereignty of the self, if you like, uh, uh, and moving away from a notion of a homogeneous uh, uh, authority of the self. Um, so uh, Derrida was, uh, uh, very keen to mobilize that uh, uh, in, the, in his last years of, um, of life. And autoimmunity be, being, well, his notion of autoimmunity was a rather uh, confused one, I think. But, uh, but um, basically it was that one's own immunity, one's own immune defenses, if you like, or responses, anyhow, uh, start to attack the self attack the self and destroy the self. So how could one imagine connecting that, say with our current pandemic? Uh, it's a very interesting question. And one, as I said, I'd like to explore further. I mean, it's, uh, it could it be that, uh, that um, uh, disease emergence, is a sort of spectre haunting 
the self of the body politic, if you like. Uh, that was, uh, I mean, he, he uh, Derrida referred to autoimmunity as a spectre uh, haunting uh, the modern self at one point. But is it, is that, is that possible to imagine? Um, and uh, could one say that uh, the other within and constituting the self is, uh, is attacking the self as well? Um, is it possible that one would think that, uh, that, um, uh, that there was a, uh, a sort of um, uh, a need, therefore, to uh, have an openness to the other within the virus, if you like, uh, in some ways, as Derrida would have claimed. I mean, in some ways, um, it is actually, it's an intriguing notion that, that you know, if, if not the self, one could actually say, or the body politic or uh, the capitalist world system, if you like. That actually is generating its its own sort of defence mechanisms, or the mechanisms which constitute itself, are actually generating uh, disease emergence in an autoimmune sense. I mean, I, 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 I I'm just speculating here. I haven't really thought this through, but uh, it is particularly. Uh, Intriguing, uh, and I, sorry to, this is perhaps a minor point, but uh, I'm finding it uh, fascinating in the sense that, you know, McFarlane Burnett, the inventor of the term disease ecology, he won his Nobel Prize in 1960 for his discovery in the 1940s of the notion of self-tolerance. And it was quite a, a clever idea, really. He said, that, you know, what's interesting about the immune system is not that it attacks the foreign uh, and defends the body, if you like. What's really interesting about it is that it does not attack itself. I mean, how does it tolerate itself? And for that insight, he actually won a Nobel Prize. There you go. But the notion of tolerance, he drew from ecology, from his reading of ecology. And from that idea of self-tolerance, of course, comes the idea of autoimmunity in the 1950s. Uh, autoimmunity. Uh, I've written about this with my uh, an immunologist, late immunologist Ian Mackay, who was one of the inventors of the term autoimmunity in the 1950s, in a book called Intolerant Bodies. But so, so you have this translation of uh, tolerance into the immunological domain. Yeah. And and then from that, you get the notion of lack of self-tolerance, autoimmunity. But what if we brought autoimmunity back into the ecological domain, the domain of disease ecology? It's a very interesting idea. Right, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I think that connection you make between the idea of tolerance and the idea of immunity, that turns the nature of the debate. Yeah. Otherwise, it, it just seems to be the humanity is borrowing one term Yes, well, so I, I think I think that's always a problem when we think yeah. of uh, the vectors of influence going in one direction. Yeah. And yeah. this is something again I've written about extensively, particularly in immunology, where uh, where the I mean Burnett himself said he thought that immunology was more uh, a, a matter of philosophy than of biology, really. Uh, and so he saw himself as a philosopher even more than he saw himself as a biologist. He certainly didn't see himself as a microbiologist. Um, and so, um, uh, and so uh, I think uh, that the, uh, uh, the influences are, of course, as it, uh, ecological. It's an ecology of knowledge. Yeah. So uh, on that, can I invite uh, one last thought from Ravi Sundram? Did you want to pose? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deepu, and uh, thank you for your lecture, which I actually just managed to see. Uh, and so I had I had one or two thoughts, if you like. They're not really questions. They're one or two thoughts. And and it's very productive that you started with Kostelek, this cognitive critique and crisis uh, of making decisions. And I think there seems to be one shift uh, coming from a media and informational point of view, uh, where the cognitive 
crisis and critique uh, is kind of sundered in a way where, uh, you know, for, for Kosalek, it's a, it's a means of periodizing time. Here, what, what is so remarkable is in this broader ecology, and here I would argue that informational is also an ecology. You, we need to bring that in into our discussion. It is an ecology. And uh, so the body of expertise, that is this whole anticipatory go government where you speculate over the future, where model building works in this anticipatory stuff, governance, I'm struck by the instability of it. The instability of it, uh, even as uh, but there is an idea that there will be closure. You know, the, in the classic cost of like, you know, there will be closure, we will return to a new normal. I wanted you to, you know, uh, speak about that a bit. A bit. This, this, this inf information coming in into the larger picture. Right, yes. <laughs> I, uh, um, where to start again? Uh, I mean, I think the, um, uh, the instability uh, of this ecology of knowledge, I think it, it, it's an interesting thought in the sense that, uh, uh, that what I see actually is repeated and often failed efforts to stabilize uh, techniques, uh, models, if you like, and they never quite uh, achieve that stability. And I guess what I see critique is doing is destabilizing uh, these uh, uh, models and uh, techniques even further. And I think uh, uh, not, not debunking them, as I said, but more actually adding to them, a gathering, if you like, uh, which would, uh, uh, and then I'm sure there'd be an attempt at restabilizing and so on, and there'd be a further gathering and further destabilizing. I mean, I think that is the way the ecology of knowledge works. I mean, I think it's, um, it's, often, it's often resisted, actually, that sort of uh, interaction, that sort of uh, uh, gathering the, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that sort of e eclectic, pragmatic, I suppose, approach um, is often resisted, of course. And, uh, you know, the, one of the uh, uh, issues, of course, in, uh, uh, in microbiology or uh, disease ecology, I guess, uh, for Burnett, for example, was that, um, that every time he tried to destabilize a sort of molecular vision of microbial life and the interactions of microbes with macrobes, if you like, every time he tried to use evolutionary biology to render that much more dynamic and heterogeneous and complex, uh, what he called the chemists would come back in and try to stabilize a molecular vision again. And he actually said that he saw that, that uh, uh, he, he regarded molecular biology as a misnomer. There was nothing biological about it. It was all molecular. And so uh, uh, he was always saying that there should be uh, greater uh, interaction of microbiologists with evolutionary biologists, with natural historians, um, with ecologists, of course. Now, what I'm basically saying is there should also be greater interaction with sociologists, anthropologists, and humanities scholars, too. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, and it was also something that I mentioned a couple of times, I think, in the talk, was the, the fact that so many of these modelers are physicists, and not so they they're very good at putting together a model at uh, the statistics but they have no real understanding of biology or social life at all. And so uh, it's interesting that uh, you know, they're, they're almost fulfilling the role of the chemist in Burnett's uh, 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 schema. Uh, and so I think in some ways uh, that um, you know, this is an opportunity for humanities scholars to join the gathering, if you like, to uh, offer critique in a constructive way and uh, to destabilize these rather uh, rather uh, inadequate, deficient uh, 
uh, framings of our current predicament. I don't want to say crisis. Now, I don't know whether that's uh, answered your question in any way, but uh, I think uh, it's uh, uh, the best I can do at the moment. Yeah, on that note, uh, we, could, we could bring this to a close. Uh, it's a very optimist note. Uh, uh, all of us are, uh, come from the political humanities, so it's, it's to think that there's something to say. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, uh, we hope uh, we can have you in person someday. Uh, but till that happens, it's been wonderful talking to you. Well, well th th thank you. Thank you. And I'm relieved to hear there are no physicists amongst you <laughs> after what I just said. <laughs> so, okay, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.